Scott Woods here from Toronto. I'm chatting on the phone with Bob Dobbs in Maui. Bob? Yes. Okay, it's um, November 9th, 2009. I chatted with Bob back in 1999, so almost 10 years ago. I don't know the exact date, but that was for a site called Pop. Uh, Bob and I talked about rock history, and Bob uh, put it in his own inimitable Bob sort of language, and uh, I wanted to really chat with Bob again as a follow-up to talk more about rock critics, and obviously this is in part for rockcritics.com. So without any further ado, Bob, um, let's get right into it. So I, I, I sent, just as a way, another way of an introduction, I sent Bob a whole sort of package of articles recently by the likes of Richard Meltzer, Chuck Eddy, Frank Kogan, Lester Bangs, Grill Marcus couple other things and I just wanted to sort of um, you know chat with Bob about those maybe throw throw get him to throw some of that stuff back at me and sort of explain it all <laughs> so but Bob before we go uh, directly into the articles themselves I just kind of wanted to you know start with a few other things so just to give some of the rockcritics.com listeners a bit of a background on some of your recent activity you do a series of I believe it's weekly chats with the writer Ben Watson, who's the author of uh, Frank Zappa's Negative Dialectics of Poodle Play, and I'll, I'll put a link up to those chats. They're, they're really amazing chats, and you and Ben basically talk a lot about, uh, well, you, you do talk about Zappa, but it's not, it's, it's, that often kind of seems almost like sideline material, but you, you, you know, you tend to talk a lot about James Joyce, Finnegan's Wake, McLuhan, Marx, um, sometimes Freud, you know, a whole, whole sort of range of stuff. So one thing you guys have kind of mentioned on a few occasions, and I, I think this is maybe going to be relevant later on in the interview, so I wanted to sort of bring it up at, at the start. Can you just give me a really sort of basic kind of explanation of, of the Joyce, James Joyce, Wyndham Lewis, I guess you'd call it the dialectic? Because I, I think you guys have alluded to the fact that you two have that dialectic going yourself, and I assume, Bob, that you're kind of the James Joyce and Ben is the Wyndham Lewis. But I'm also sort of thinking of it in regards to, um, like, even Lester Bangs and Richard Meltzer in some ways. And I think I think you've also related it to Zappa and Beefheart. So I, but I, I don't know where you're going with that. And, and I'll tell you off the bat that I know a little bit about James Joyce and very little about Wyndham Lewis. And I'm not asking you to, you know, fill in all the gaps for all the blanks for me on that, but, you know, whatever. Okay, so the the dialectic between Joyce and Lewis is what you want clarified a exactly. little. Exactly, yeah. Uh, well, they were both born in 1882, and uh, Wyndham Lewis was born in the uh, the Bay Bay of Fundy, which is the bay as, that surrounds Nova Scotia in Canada. And right at the uh, isthmus, where the bay, uh, it could be cut off. The no, it could be an island, but there's a little isthmus joining it with New Brunswick. And there's a place called Amherst there, and that's where Wyndham Lewis was born. He was the uh, uh, son of uh, an American businessman, uh, happy-go-lucky guy, and a British woman. I think that's the way it is. So they split. And Wyndham Lewis was grew up in London, and I think she was a pretty uh, culture vulture mother, you know, sophisticated. So he got into art school real early, and he was a genius at painting, which is sort of like Beefheart as a young genius in sculpture. You know what I mean? He was a young prodigy. And 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 uh, Wyndham Lewis, 1916, 1920 pictures, he looks just like Cap, like Don Van Vliet, which is interesting. So um, so Wyndham Lewis. What else to say? Uh, so he was a Canadian, but he had British citizenship also. And so, and when he fought in World War One, he fought as a Canadian, but then he also did stuff painting for the British troops. So he's always in between. Okay, so he's a painter and an intellectual and a thinker. Joyce grows up in Dublin, and he's a, a singer. He's a musician and a thinker and all that. And so you have... As McClellan would lay it out, you have the eye man Lewis versus the ear man Joyce. And so Wyndham Lewis set up, created the Vortices scene in 1914, and he had as his colleagues, uh, Ezra Pound and, and T.S. Eliot and a few other people. And Lewis was the, 
the Frank Zappa of 1966 bursting on the scene. He was so powerful, you know, everybody uh, learned from him. Because he'd been in Europe in the, te- in the, in the knots, running around because he left art school, you know, at the age of 18 or so, and done that and was really good at it. And then he uh, ran around, uh, learned what was happening in Europe. So he knew more what was happening in Europe by 1914 than the artists in London. So it's just like Zappa. You look on the cover of Freak Out, he's got uh, 179 names, right? For his generation, he was the most well-versed in all kinds of music. You follow that, Scott? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's what Wyndham Lewis was. Here's a guy looking like Beefheart, but having the impact of Zappa in 1966, back in 1914. And But then when he went to the war, he got, he got shocked and traumatized by the war, and that changed him. Okay, so James Joyce is discovered by Pound, and he's in Switzerland in 1916, and he's writing Ulysses. And he starts reading Wyndham Lewis's Enemy of the Stars, which is published in the big uh, magazine journal that Pound and Lewis put out in 1914 called Blast. Okay. And and this Enemy of the Stars is, is prophetic. It's the most you know, hallucinatory thing. It's, it's, it's theater of the absurd already and uh, other things. And that influenced Joyce, and he changed his Ulysses and added a little more hallucinatory aspect in the Cersei episode, which was near the end of Ulysses. Plus, he was influenced by the data scene in uh, Zurich. So Lewis had an influence on Joyce, and they became friends around 1920 when Joyce moved to Paris. So they were buddies, but Joyce's Ulysses uh, in 1922 really put Joyce on the map, and Lewis wasn't getting that much publicity, even though they both put out novels about being an artist in the teens. And so Portrait of the Artist's Young Man, I think, uh, had an impact, but... Lewis's book Tar T A R R came out in 1918, 1919. Right. Had, it did better for a moment, and okay. so it looked like Lewis was going to be the writer of his generation. And but then Joyce won up them with Ulysses, and Lewis, very competitive or something, uh, he he withdrew and got upset about that. So he was out to nail Joyce in a way, or outdo Joyce. But right. he. But he understood what Joyce was working on. He had influenced Joyce, and they both studied anthropology and all kinds of things. They were eclectic minds and equal geniuses. And back then, if you were an independent artist, you had to get publicity to survive. You had to make a scene in the newspaper world. So Ulysses made a scene being pornographic or whatever, right? It was, right. And it was banned. So Lewis, um, he, made, he got attention by being the outsider critic and satirizing uh, even the avant-garde of London the Bloomsbury Group. So there always was this competition and appreciation, love-hate relationship between uh, Joyce and Lewis, like Beefheart and Zappa, you know? Okay. Uh, and the um, uh, Lewis took on, he, he saw what Joyce did, and I, I really recommend you read uh, uh, The Art of Being Ruled or Time in Western Man, where it has Wyndham Lewis's essays on Joyce and many other things, and they're really brilliant essays. And he's staking out his position opposite to Joyce. Joyce, he sees as an, eye, an ear man lost in the flux of time, emotion, and sentiment. Whereas, yeah. whereas Lewis is the hard-edged, almost scientific, literate, objective guy, which he calls the school of space. And, Lewis, and Joyce is the space of the, uh, the devolving school of time, and he's the, and Lewis is the space of is the school of space or the eye. So it's eye versus the ear. And Joyce knows this, and you can see it all the way through the wake. There's a whole section where there's a debate between him and Lewis, and he's quoting via puns. You have to know the references to, to know what's happening in the, the polyglot language of Finney's Wake. If you know the references, you can see that it's I, I man Lewis, uh, confronting the ear man Joyce. And it's called the Muxi and the Grapes, uh, the Fox and the Grapes, uh, Aesop Fables, what it's based on, and it builds from there. So you have Lewis not being sort of emotional, and Joyce being musical and emotional. This is very crude, simple terms, but back then, that's how people, uh, they would respond instinctively, like, oh, Lewis, this guy, he's like so detached, he's inhuman. And Joyce is, like, celebrating the voluptuousness of the woman's skirts or something and, like, totally 
stoned almost. It's like <laughs> Lewis is stoned without taking a drug, and Joyce is stoned while taking the drug, right? Right, okay. And uh, so um, that, and, and Lewis is, understands Joyce. He's the first to satirize Finnegan's Wake when it was 10 years before it was published. In 1928, he put out a book called um, uh, The Childer, Childer Mass. And, okay, yeah. And, it, and Joyce is just publishing Finning's Wake as work in progress in Transition Magazine, you know, a cultural magazine in France, in Paris. And nobody knows what Joyce is doing, but Lewis takes it on and satirizes it right there in Childer Mass in 1928 in the style. He, he tries to outdo the Finning's Wake style. And uh, so there was this uh, interaction. So basically... Um, that would be the simple spy versus spy cartoon outline of Lewis okay. versus of Lewis versus Joyce. Once you get into the writing, they're very similar. They're equally uh, th these categories fall apart. But the point is, even Joyce knew that these categories worked on the cartoon level, which is a mode in Finnegan's Wake. Now, all this is relevant because when we get into Melter and this stuff, the theme that I'm bringing to it is that Finnegan's Wake is rock and roll in print or rock, or hip-hop, modern electrified music, in print. Now, that's an incredible uh, pattern once you get it, and then you can fit all this stuff that Meltzer, Bangs, and them are trying to work out uh, through, through that filter. So that's why you have Lewis um, and Joyce paralleling Marx versus McLuhan, Zappa versus Beefheart, and remember the argument that Lewis purposely made himself opposite of Joyce to get publicity so right. he could sell his books. It's all within the PR game or okay. sensationalism, which P. Fern Zappa did. And McLuhan and uh, Marx did. They all played the media. Okay. So McLuhan and Marx weren't together at the same time. Though. No, but Marx says a meme was around, you know, it, it's McLuhan right, right, called yeah. it. It's a genre of literature, Marx's studies. Okay. It's a type of literature. And but Marx as a as a product of the telegraph era. I mean he's the telegraph has brought together the working class around the world and he's the uh the Abbey Hoffman of it. Right, okay. And wasn't McLuhan's criticism of uh, Marx that he didn't perceive the effects of the technology? Of the, the communications technology. technology. Communications technology. Yeah, see, Marx was good at the uh, hardware environment, the production, means of production, and what that did, but McLuhan would say that Marx missed the effects of the telegraph in allowing Marx to become well-known, and then missing later the effect of radio on Moscow, and why you have a different kind of communism in Russia. So okay. Marx, and he didn't understand, I don't think, Ben might find quotes that uh, disagree with this, Ben Watson, but he did not see how software would become the major means of production and wealth generation in the 20th century. Okay. Not okay. factory work. Okay. So that puts okay. the unions into a weak case, you know, in the long run. Right. Okay. Okay, a different uh, sort of thought altogether. Bob, see if you can be the first person to say something interesting about... <laughs> This this old cliche of a of a quote that is probably if you were to Google it you'd probably find like you know twenty two thousand <laughs> examples of it. The quote is this: writing about rock music is like dancing about architecture. Now the quote, by the way, has been attributed to tons of people, including Frank Zappa, but the earliest person I've actually seen it attributed to is um, Thelonious Monk, and and I don't think anyone knows definitively who said it, although I think lots of people have said it, maybe even thinking that they were the you know, the person who invented it or something weird. But but it's just it's this quote that is kind of everywhere and I've not really heard um, you know, anything sort of in, intelligent or interesting about it. I, is there anything intelligent or interesting to say about it? No, it's a writing perfect. about rock music is like dancing about architecture. That is a, a perfect quote to illustrate uh, why fitting his wake is rock and roll in print. Um, the the hidden factor about electrified music is that it's not the ear and it's not the eye or the kinetic muscle, it's tactile. And jazz was the first electrified music, okay, played over the radio and then with the uh, broadcast system and microphones. The electrification of music is not Beethoven, Mozart and that stuff. 
when you and then you okay so if tactility is electrified music the tactile is the interplay of the senses and so you think of synesthesia you know what synesthesia is right where you where you yeah. yeah synesthesia is where you hear something but you see the music or you um you smell something and you can you can hear a sound from it now you'll get synesthesia if you take you know drugs like lsd and, and maybe marijuana your senses start getting scrambled your sensory inputs and so they get all mixed up and that's called synesthesia all right so okay. yep. writing about music and dancing about architecture is totally appropriate when you understand the 20th century is largely a tactile synesthetic environment <laughs> it actually makes sense um, it, it, um, we are writing about music we are dancing about architecture because architecture can be expanded if we move from the ear man uh, excuse me from the eye man who who has definite Oxford dictionary definitions for architecture all of modern 20th century art is to blur those distinctions that literacy creates and, and categories that are hardened hardening of the categories modern art likes to uh, to blur that and to blur it is to move into the ear side of things uh, okay. okay so the um, so architecture is not just buildings it is the highways that are built right you know the environments are architecture so you expand the meaning of architecture and then you say what is music well McLuhan said that uh, teenage music rock rock and roll in the 50s 60s was not music it was an environment and that's a correct way to begin to approach rock and roll because it is electrified and is perceived in all different kinds of acoustic media, radios, transistors, and concert halls, and loud and soft. So since it's synesthetic, the communication environment, so we're not, we're not, we're not inside, when we're inside a building and we're listening to radio, we're not limited to the building. We're listening to something that's coming through. We're discarnate. So to actually determine where you are from the eye point of view is limited. To determine where you are from the ear point of view is limited. To, to, de to determine it through the kinetic expression, like dancing, is limited. You have to realize that writing is music, is dancing, is architecture, is tactile implosion. Right, okay. And so when you know the senses and the machines that are extension senses are imploded, increasingly as the 20th century un unfolds, you can you know that as McLuhan said the 20th century is a surrealistic canvas from the get-go right so you see an eye a literate person will say writing about now okay so an ear person ear bias would say no music is an antidote to the stupid literate guys you, you know the scientists the, the writers we loosen you up when you come to our club you've been reading your newspapers and accounting books all day long we loosen you up we get you out of the visual space trance right. so, the, so the musician would say we don't want to hear about your writing. We're here to cancel the effect of writing, so don't even begin to write about us. <laughs> okay, so that's the fanatic of the ear. The um, fanatic of the eye would say, okay, architecture is a building, and it's a library, and you don't make noise in here, you don't dance in here. Because the eye guy says architecture is limited to what you think a building is, and doesn't notice that the ear qualities, the tactile, kinesthetic, other forms of media sensibility so both the eye and the ear are biased so the the uh, ear guy says no writing about music and the ear, the eye guy says no dancing about architecture it's an eye thing you must know your your draftsman ability you must know how to critique and see the, the lay of the building and the engineering that's all eye stuff right so, so right. the eye guy doesn't tolerate dancing so so what is it uh writing about music is like dancing about architecture so so the eye guy um would not, would not appreciate Mercy Cunningham or Martha Graham's interpretation of architecture. It was something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. I can understand a musician saying, no writing about music. I mean, a, a fanatic musician, a cool musician, you know, a comprehensive musician wouldn't be limited to that. They'd enjoy the writing because it's translating your music into another sense, and that's the only way you can know anything, by translating one thing into another modality. Now, who would say, who would complain about dancing about architecture? You know, that shifts, uh, the musician might say that, but it sounds like a, an eye guy would say, that's like dancing about, uh, it's actually mixed up, that's, that metaphor. 
It, it is very mixed up. Yeah, which is good. That's synesthetic. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming that a musician is complaining about writing about music, and he's saying that. So then the musician would say, uh, that's like dancing but architects. But that's absurd for a musician. A musician's all for dancing. Well, no, no, it, 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 it's more common usage, though, is, is actually by critics or music journalists saying, you know, it, it, they're kind of like trying to sort of fess up to the futility of what they're doing. Like, you know, writing about music, oh, how, how can you write about music? It's, it's like dancing about architecture. How can you do that? That's and, sort of, and that's, that's where the ellipses leads to how could, how could you do such a thing. Yes, and that's why culture, as McLuhan said, culture's our business, and culture's our plantation, and everybody is like Robert Crisco and these guys are forced to review all these records because they need to survive, and they need to make sure Melcher doesn't uh, screw up the record industry so they don't get ads for the Village Voice and all that stuff. Everybody working the culture business is, is, is a slave and not very happy, and and yet he's forced to write about, uh, you know, the uh, he's supposed to write about music. So everybody's self-conscious about what they're forced to do, and they'll say things like that, but that doesn't stop anything, and they keep writing about music. Right, right. And 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 you build on Finnegan's Wake, and you you get a, a vision, which is what I'm trying to. Uh, and part to Ben Watson, a vision that makes one more articulate about the drama of what's going on, and you wouldn't be stuck sort of resignedly, cynically saying, write about music, like dancing about architecture. You know, you would celebrate the fact that you're writing about it, or that you're right. dancing, if you understood the tactile nature of the 20th century. So we're going to go into that when we get into these quotes, but if you want to go to your next point that you have already laid out. Okay, we well, actually, actually, since you mentioned... Um Criscow, and uh, you, you, I'm pulling a quote from you in, in your chat with Ben Watson when, and I know I'm pulling this, you know, probably out of context, which maybe is okay, but... Oh, wait a minute, before we go on, so okay. what I just, you wanted to have an original response to that. I, I scored 100% on that, right? Yeah, exactly, 110. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's an original response to that cliche. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's flipping the cliche to... It's like, yeah, well, why wouldn't it be, and why wouldn't you celebrate that? Yeah, it's also, it's finding it saying more than people who are limited to their eye, eye or ear bias, finding out more what's being said by that phrase. That, that. So, sorry, say that again? We're, I'm showing there's more in the statement, writing about music like dancing about architecture, than an eye biased or ear biased person would find. Right, right. So That's I'm not right. stuck in the cliche. I consider it a, a relevant statement. It's very useful. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so you 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 said uh, on, on your Be Bob and Ben show a few episodes ago, um, you know that rock criticism is stupid, and you kind of pointed to the example of someone like Robert Criscow, who you know he's he's basically someone who's been reviewing like twenty records a month for about forty years now, <laughs> um, and you know I mean the the one thing you you said in your last little thing there was you know. Like, I mean, I wouldn't put Robert Criscow in the camp of people who would be unhappy at all about what they're doing or, or would use that quote in some disparaging way or something. I mean, I think Robert Criscow loves what he's doing, actually. Yeah. But, but to tell me, why is rock criticism stupid and why, why do you put, think of an example like someone like a Criscow who, I like, for me, that kind of work would be absolutely drudgerous to do that. I, could, I wouldn't be hardwired to, to be able to pull something like that off. So, I don't know, go into that a little bit. Well, it's, it's, what I say is always dependent on who I'm talking to, and in the Ben context, uh, that's why I said right. that. But, <laughs> but now I'm talking to you, I would say that um, what I meant that the rock writing was, was, uh, was stupid was you end up working for the industry and killing your ears and listening to this stuff and having to perform. And I agree with Meltzer. It's a disgusting industry, basically. I, I get that from Dave Neufeld, too. Uh, to be involved with these idiot flacks and records and promos, it's a crummy job. Uh, they, it might be better than working in a factory or being homeless, but um, I think your lip, since it is an extension of the industry, you can't probe it like Meltzer did. Uh, he got kicked out, and Meltzer, he didn't know it, but he was on the right track in terms of trying to philosophically explain what his joy was and what he was noticing. So um, I would say any long-term job of consumption like that is stupid. So now I wouldn't just limit to rock criticism, but we were talking about it with Ben, so I said, yeah, rock criticism is stupid, and that's why Ben left. He had the same right. problem. You can't... Uh, now, this, is, this raises a good question, which is what Finney's Wake raises is, 
Are you dead? Is, is Robert Crisco, does he have good ears? Does, uh, if, you're, if he's good at assessing an album for the industry and critiquing it, or I don't know what he does with it, I don't read his reviews, but um, is he really on a drug? You know, is, he, is this uh, useful for creating perception? I mean, they're just ra- ramming out music all over the place right now. Do we need to hear it? Bet definitely young people need to hear it because they're groping through life. They're trying to expand their senses, and they love it. doesn't matter what it is. They're going to like it, you know? So uh, it's, electri- it's the electrified tactile experience. So to sit in that industry and, and uh, make judgments about this environment that's a global drug, global heroin, uh, you have to be cynical. You have to say, well, I'll just write this crap and uh, I'll keep getting paid and um, I don't have to go work for someone else. Yeah, but I mean, okay, but okay, if I take, I mean, I can't obviously speak for someone like Robert Criscow, but I mean, I, I think what would drive him to continue doing what he does is he just, he likes doing it. He he, he has a compulsion to like lis- listen to like tons of albums all yeah, the time. Yeah, he's addicted. And it, it is true. Apparently he, he is, a, like he listens to it all the time, but it's, you know, I mean, he's a writer. He, so he, it, it's, it's, his cho- it's his chosen subject to write about. And he wants to explore it from as many. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of taking sides here a little bit because it's like, it's his. It, it, he wants. It's what he wants to explore. So why wouldn't he want to explore? Like, I just don't think it necessarily has anything to do with the industry per se. That he's no, I say. I know. I know that's his function that he's doing that, but I don't think he's doing that because, you know. I'd say he's I, addicted. I'm gonna, I'm gonna prop up the industry or something like that. He, he's, he's got. Uh, He's, a, he's got virtual ears. He's addicted. Now, here's the other part of why rock writing is stupid. I castigate it all from Melter to Bangs and Crisco and everybody else because they don't begin to teach people the way a real critical function is supposed to be. They don't teach people and begin with the notion of rock, Finning's Wake is rock and roll and print. They don't tell anybody a way to get a, a perspective on all this phenomena that everybody's addicted to. And they... <laughs> they do not teach properly, is what I'm saying, in their role. And they probably couldn't. And then they would include, remember, James Joyce handed Finnegan's Wake over to another guy to continue writing in the late 20s. Okay. All right? It's not a personal role to do Finnegan's Wake. It's a corporate role. These guys have, uh, these critics have a corporate role of, the, of uh, enlightening the consumer about what's useful and what isn't. And they don't offer a big picture view of the larger thing because they always think they're working for the revolution or not working for the revolution, and they don't even know what the revolution is. So we're talking about a bunch of kids, guys who maybe uh, Crisco went to Dartmouth and, uh, and Meltzer went to Yale, but they got they never got the real important information that was happening in the real rock and roll avant garde, which was Mr. McLuhan up in Toronto. He, this is what's interesting, how you notice that Meltzer sounds like McLuhan. And we'll go into that later. And it's, yeah. it's very good that you brought that up with him. I didn't know until I just read your interview with him. But the, the point is is that there is no, there's no justification for what they're doing other than they're just little nodes, dangling participles, responding to electronic stimulus that is just an endless tidal wave that they're just uh, sending out blips and signals about. You can get a perspective and put this rock and roll experience into a meaningful pattern. And then that would, that might, if you really get my point, you'll be so stoned on this insight that you actually could stop listening to music because part of the addiction is they're trying to find out why they like it. And you can't do it if you just use your eye and your ear. You've got to understand what tactility is and how electric music is tactile. And then you have to see how to look at it. And you look at it through Finney's Wake. So we'll develop that more. So there, there's two ways to say rock writing is stupid. All those guys are stupid, not because, just because they're industry lackeys. Is that they never learned the lesson from it or what it meant. That's, and now it might be amazing just to pronounce that you know, rock and roll is meaningful in the way I'm intending to. But we'll get to that. I'll prove my point. <laughs> well... <laughs> But okay, so so I mean, I, I've certainly I feel like I've I've gotten some insights, some genuine insights from these people, and 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 even if you want to look at it on the McLuhan kind of level or whatever, someone like Meltzer certainly sort of intuits some of that, I guess. Or I mean, I guess we will get into that, but yeah, I, I'm I'm having a hard time kind of 
Like, I, I, I don't know. It's like Finnegan's Wake is kind of... You don't know what I mean I, yet. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, true. that's okay. I'm just, I'm just saying what uh, the insight that we're going to get to, if it's okay. possible. So okay. I want to finish your questions that you have, the preamble questions, we'll call them. Okay, we're almost done, though. So okay. um, this, is, this is kind of a, a bit of a bizarre tangent, but I'm curious, Bob, why you think there's more, way more male rock critics than female rock critics? Uh, it's um, the left hemisphere, left hemisphere male forced to adapt to the electric right hemisphere environment and keep his left hemisphere going. So that's the absurdity of rock criticism. It's the left hemisphere trying to make sense out of a right hemisphere experience. So that is writing about music. It looks absurd. It's the left hemisphere trying to explain the right hemisphere. So traditionally, if you believe the right hemisphere, left hemisphere dialectic, and it, had, it ran its course through the 80s. People believed it for a while. Now it's bunked. Uh, debunked, but uh, so what? Every meme has a has power once it's established. It's still there. So from the perspective of that, a left hemisphere is more in the male brain. So it's the left hemisphere trying to uh, explain the right hemisphere environment, and for a literate right a left hemisphere culture, that's America, and America wants to read about it. So the men would be better at it than women. You know, the, the need for Americans is that they're innately, almost like a genetic uh, feature, they are left hemisphere. They, they don't know how to implement it anymore, uh, but they are basically, that's our fundamentalism, is left hemisphere. And so the left hemisphere approach to right hemisphere environment, right hemisphere environment being rock and roll, is easily supplied by males. You follow that? Okay, yeah, yeah. Now there are lots of female writers, but you're saying that sure. the 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 male writer seems to make a bigger impact. The field is dominated by. I mean, I mean, it's less it's less so now than than it used to be, mm. obviously. Um, just just like, I mean, pop music itself is less dominated by male. I mean, well, it's always been a mix of male and female in the music itself, but you know, in terms of kind of who who dominates the discussion, I mean. You know, if you think of pop music in the in the '60s and certainly the '50s, yeah, there were a lot of female singers, but there weren't a, you know a lot of self sort of formed female bands and that sort of stuff. And that was really kind of more like an outgrowth of punk and all that sort of stuff. So, similar kind of uh, shift in in gender has has probably erupted in the writing, but the field still seems the the, the sort of geekier aspects of the field certainly seem to be dominated by by the men. Yeah, geek. That's a left hemisphere trying to prop up the eye in an ear tactile environment. That's what a nerd geek is. Now, let, I'll give an example of the relevance of Lewis. Lewis, you know, had lots of friends who were artists. And there's the story that he would go over and look at a friend's painting, you know, go into the guy's studio, and he would uh, stand there with his feet solidly planted in front of the painting and stare at it for a long time. Then remove himself from looking at the painting and leave the uh, studio without making any comment. <laughs> and, and people ask him, why don't you ever comment? And he says, a nonverbal art does not require a verbal response. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, his eye is looking at an eye expression, the painting, and he's only going to have an eye response, no verbal response. So he was trying to keep the, the art separate. He knew the modalities, understood the implosion and the tactile effect that was happening, but he said, no, the eye must remain solid. He's a fanatic of the eye, a fundamentalist of the eye. And so he broke up, uh, broke up the senses that were emerging under electric conditions, where Joyce obviously took the other mode. He, he imploded them, creating the stream of consciousness of Ulysses and then the more fantastic style of thinning his wake, where you, there's not one word readable. He implodes all the senses. So, so um, Wyndham Lewis is giving an eye response. Now, he's representing traditional Western culture, an eyeball culture. And when the eyeball culture has to respond to uh, the tactile electric environment of rock, that culture will want the eye to be represented. Look at that great line, maybe the greatest line in Finnegan's Wake, uh, page 52 in the middle of the page. Television kills telephony and brothers broil. The eyes demand their turn. Let them be seen. So in, in you have to take 
uh, the writing about music is like dancing about architecture. No, writing about music is not dancing about architecture in a visual culture, in an alphabetized literary culture. Writing is very imp- is the only way the literary culture can approach music. So that's uh, that's. Uh, is, is the television kills telephony? Is that a is that a, a precursor to a video killed the radio star? Yeah, all we it's the deeper you get into Phoenix Wake. There's not one idea since uh, the book came out in 39, that is not already in the wake. That's what the incredible thing is. So yeah, video, Kill the Radio Star, is a replay, a quoting, unknowingly, of uh, the patterns laid out in Finnegan's Wake. And the best translator of those patterns was McLuhan. And McLuhan, here's the interesting point, McLuhan learned how to look at the wake on a personal level, like who was his mentor? His mentor was Wyndham Lewis. He met him. Right. Talked to him, promoted him in the, during the war in uh, St. Louis. Okay. When, when McLuhan was teaching down there. You see how it's interesting. Who meets who is important. Who you get to know uh, is probably predestined, or uh, if you're going to be uh, follow your path, your joy, it's, it's the connections that are interesting. You know, who meets who and who does what. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's interesting about Meltzer talking about knowing Patti Smith back in the early days, and then he and his buddies agreeing she uh, turned into a problem. Right. So what, what do you mean? Like what, what's Well, that uh, Meltzer is an authority, and his, his, his writings are interesting because he met the people before they were known. Right, right. And actually an interesting uh, sort of flip there, too, is, is I guess before... Patti Smith was really well known. I think it was back when she was maybe more known as a poet or something before she put out an album. There apparently her and Meltzer were both at some conference of rock critics in I think nineteen seventy four or something and and all the all the panelists were asked, you know, what's 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 your definition of rock and roll and and I think Patti Smith actually stood up and said, Whatever Richard Meltzer whatever Richard Meltzer says, that's rock and roll. <laughs> so she was like totally deferring to him. Because <laughs> uh, no. he was he kinda was the star at that time. Yes. And uh, do you know, I've ever told you a story of my interaction with Patti Smith? No, no. You see, if you read one of my interviews, I don't know which one it is, that was in Flipside, you'll see Jerry introduces it saying that I created inspired punk rock. Uh, We'll leave, I don't want to go into that, but I was there at CBGB's in 75, and uh, I was with Dean Latimer and the old East Village Other Gang that came out of Walter Bowert's scene, and... I did not know Patti Smith, didn't know who she was, but uh, I wanted to meet Dean at CBGB, so I don't think I was there in 1974, so it was April April 75, and I, th- I think it was her famous week at CBGB. Remember she was given a two-week run, and Dylan came, and that really sparked her? That yeah, sounds familiar, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I didn't know anything about that, so I'm just there, and this woman comes on and starts playing, and so obviously she's a poet, and it's a bit different take, so at the intermission I went up to her and I said, uh, do you know Finnegan's Wake? And uh, she says, yeah, I'm educated. I know it. I said, well, um, I think Finnegan's Wake is fitting into what you're doing. Of course, I already had that line. I said it to everybody. But <laughs> <laughs> I was working on duty back then. So I was planting the dogma then. And so she goes, okay, I'll think about that. So when she came back out in the second set, she uh, did some more songs and every now and then weaved in the phrase Finnegan's Wake or did a little take on it. <laughs> she improvised it and fit it in. And then there's some subsequent encounters I had with her, but I won't go into them. But uh, okay. <laughs> it's it's interesting. Uh, that's see, incredible. Yeah, that's it. In, in light of what I'm saying now, I did not know I'd be saying in this situation, <laughs> and that Bangs had died and Meltzer had been kicked out. I did not all that in, in '75, but now it's all the effects preceding the causes. It's all prophetic. <laughs> and I just finished <laughs> reading Meltzer's complaint about Patty Smith. <laughs> you know, an hour ago. Okay, okay, cool. In your interview with with Meltzer. Right, right. Okay. Um let's 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 actually go into a little bit of the actually I don't want to go into the Meltzer stuff first. I wanted to throw a couple of the Lester Bangs quotes at you actually. So from from the Lester Bangs uh craft work piece that I sent you. Okay, let me just get it. I'll move forward here. Sure. I've got the pile of articles. Sure. Um it was really great to read these again. Now, I may not have all the pages here because I've kind of for, I've kind of copied and pasted some of these into my notes, but yeah, here it is a craft work feature. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so 
he's he's talking to the I can't remember what this quote is, but here here's the quote. He's saying Which page oh, no, is the, it? The member of see I don't know what page it is because oh. I've copied and pasted some of the notes. Okay. But one of the band members says to Bangs, I think, anything a hand can do a machine can do better. And then Bangs says, an addendum would seem to be that anything a hand can do nervously, a machine can do effortlessly. So is is that is, is that like a misunderstanding of McLuhan's idea that technologies are extensions of our beings? No, no, it's not bad. That's what was interesting about reading uh, Bangs and these guys and, and Meltzer or anybody on the scene. I mean, I remember the first Rolling Stone little article on David Bowie, you know, when he had long hair and just came over. It might have been about 1970, came over to the yeah. States. He, he might want to look this up, and I appreciate you sending me that article on McLuhan at the San Francisco College in Rolling Stone. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have that, but that's a great article, and um, it's just nice to have it in email form. Yeah, and, yeah. Okay, so around, the, that's about 1970, that article, so around that time, here's David Bowie being quoted, and me being the McLuhan potential archivist, noting, knowing McLuhan should be talked a lot more than was, here's this little kid going, wow, I'm really interested in McLuhan. <laughs> Did you know that David Bowie said that? No, no, no idea. Yeah, I mean, you have to go back and go through. You remember he had long hair when he first came over, before he's 71? Absolutely, yeah. Before he was, it was more like an androgynous thing rather than the full-out glam sort of phase or whatever. Yeah, it's 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 almost like he's a folk singer folky, or something. Folky almost, yeah. Yeah, if you can go and find a Rolling Stone article, I'm pretty sure it was Rolling Stone, find that. It's a good quote to find in you know in the yeah. microfilm. So so um, the point is, is that's why one would follow the young intellectuals, the McLuhan had made it, it, they all knew a bit about McLuhan, you know, distorted. But I was going to say, McLuhan was kind of very, like, quoted by a lot of people then, too. Yeah. Right? Like he, was, he was like a pop cult sort of figure at that point. He was like Ulysses. Not everybody read Ulysses in the 20s, but right, they knew right. it was important. They knew they had to say it was important. That's what McLuhan was. I mean, he made a big impact, so they had to uh, respond to that. And, right. of course, they got, there were so many so much information back then overload that McLuhan got lost in the flood pretty quickly but uh, it was always interesting to see McLuhan pop up in a conversation um, uh, by Bangs or Bowie quoting him so well, now what was I going to say about this so okay so oh, but that's why I would read Bangs and them to see when they would get to the nub of the matter and that's what's good about this particular article because they bring up this point about what is an extension and what isn't. This is obviously a derivative of McLuhan, but the thing is is that this came all from Finney's Wake, and that's what Kraftwerk and Banks don't know. They don't know that part. Okay. Okay, so read, okay, so is the extension, is, it, is, is the machine more important than the handcraft? Now, McLuhan would say, and he said it many times in the 50s, 60s, that the machine became an art form in the 20s with the constructivists and uh, Joyce Pound and the Vortices and Lewis, they turned the machine, the hardware machine into an art form because there was a new environment, the software environment, which was kind of invisible, but was making people see the older environment, which was the machine. And so the, to say the machine is, um, is better than the hand is a position stated in the 20s by different artistic schools, okay? And then there's the reaction to that. You know, people, I don't believe that, and they go back to pre-Raphaelitism or uh, medievalism or surrealism. They react to it. But here's the interesting thing is that Kraftwerk is saying this, and Lester Bangs is thinking about it and arguing with it. They're both what I call extensions of the Android meme, which is a replay of everything up to 1945. So they don't even know, Bangs and Kraftwerk, that they're arguing McLuhan, and they don't know that that argument is an old argument. And resolved as well as one a human could do with finning his wake. See, it would have been fantastic if I was at these interesting points to come in. And when I did talk to Bangs, I bring this stuff, but they weren't. It. They didn't know what I was talking about. You know, they they didn't know. Uh, it's interesting. Here's Bangs sort of doing McLuhan line. He might not even know it. Maybe in retrospect, he know it. But if I came in and said this is a McLuhan doll, he said, No, McLuhan has nothing to do with this. I, you know, Bangs might say that. They didn't recognize, they didn't recognize, and it's so important, and we'll get to it. What Meltzer says about McLuhan is absolutely absurd. No, no, and I, and I, and I think I know where you're going with that, and, and I've often thought that it's like, yeah, I mean, he's even got a couple of uh, McLuhan references in the aesthetics of rock, yes. where he kind of, he disses him. 
Yeah, they don't and get it that he's doing that he's trying to get to McClellan's understanding of rock. Yeah, although he does say in his introduction, I know we're getting a bit off, but he says in his introduction, you know, after he got kicked out of Yale yeah. and stuff and he cried, he said, you know, I'll never be the McLuhan of rock. That's what he was thinking at the time kind of thing. So he, he obviously, like, had it on his, his mind. And Everybody, any smart kid back then, because, look, that's in 1965, 66 when he gets kicked out of Yale. That's when McLuhan yeah. is really uh, strong. He's new and people are listening to him. By 68, 69, which is, according to McLuhan, 600 years later, because we live 200 years every 12 months in the 60s. So yeah. 600 years later, by 68, 69, you're going to be dissing McLuhan. He's old ass. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Which is an effect of the electric environment that one should be aware of, that things will age right in front of your eyes because the tactile environment turns it over so quickly. You should try to figure out how you're being seduced by that and not lose not uh, go with the flow and and be melted away and and actually unconsciously tune into the new effect and think, oh yeah, McLuhan's old hat and uh, Bucky Fuller is where it's at or something like that. You, right, right. you you get swept along and put through changes and you're not fully aware of it. And that's that's what we're leading towards. This is the way, this is what Chris Gow and them should be teaching, which is, you know, obviously a silly word to be applied to them, but it's, we're doing that. I am the melter of our time. I am Alyssa Banks pronging you guys, complaining like Banks and Melter did, that you guys aren't paying attention to the real meaning of rock. But it's it's certainly a different meaning in way we talk about today because rock is long gone, disappeared. It's over, you know. But not for the young kids. They're the little, as McLuhan said in the 60s, young people are vegetables. You let them grow and evolve, and they might get to a human level. He said that about kids in the 60s. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm saying rock critics are like vegetables. We... We, we have to put up with their nonsense digressions over decades as they grow and evolve into approximating a tactile perception and becoming a fully-fledged cell. But, but, but what if, but I mean, there's, there's, but they, they're making some perceptions there, too. Ah, but, but they all crack up. I'm going to explain how, why they crack up. Why did Meltzer freak out? Well, yeah, but Meltzer, okay, but Meltzer is a very sort of specific um, case in that regard. I mean, you know, you've... you've no, mean, but you've the, got, you've, Grail you've Marcus, Robert, here's the thing. Grail Mark, I mean, someone like Grail Marcus, I mean, he, that's another tangent, but I mean, he's... Not he's a tangent. Probably, okay, he's probably kept himself kind of interested in going as a music critic because he doesn't just write about music. No, no, they're, they're, they're machines. Chris Gow and Marcus are machines. Meltzer is a nostalgic uh, nature lover. He wants to get back to the chemical body. He's a romantic. And he says, you guys accepted being a machine, which then ties back into this statement between Kraftwerk and Banks. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, the... the uh, uh, forget... Oh, yeah, uh, what was it? Uh, the machine. Can't remember. Remember, Andy Warhol says, I want to be a machine. He says that in the middle 60s. Right. Okay, but to say, McLuhan said, I want to be global programmer of the computer thermostat. Way beyond just being a machine, I'm going to be, I'm going to include fascism, communism, capitalism, and free enterprise, and anarchism all within my program. I'm not just going to be a machine, I'm going to be able to mold the machine, orchestrate it with the software machine. And, and uh, that we'll get into later, because I could say all this stuff and go all the way to the end, but it's no point. Where we're going to gradually replay, come back, and move forward. When Meltzer is impressed with McLuhan's review of Naked Lunch, boy, have I got a lot to say about that. And, and okay, good. His, his interpretation is is immature and silly and uninformed. But here's what I want to. Okay. Oh yeah, I, I once uh, listened to. Mar I was with Marcus in L.A. one time, and he was giving a performance, talking, reviewing something. I uh, gave a lecture, and so in the question period, I brought up Finnegan's Wake, and uh, as I always do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm always on point. You, okay. you, you remember what, uh, you know the story of Zappa when he goes through German customs and the Fritz, the, the customs guy, assumes Zappa's on drugs? No, no, I don't know. And he says to Frank, okay, Frank, what do you want? You know, what drug are you having there and you're going to have to give to me before you go through customs? Frank says, I'm on duty. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. You have said that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great line. Well, I'm on duty. I come across Grail Marcus in the 90s. So I bring up Finnegan's Wake, and Grail Marcus, I mean, he's a professor at Yale or Harvard or something, right? 
Yeah, I don't know. Specific. I think he's done a lot of different professors. Yeah, okay. So he he's a literate guy. I bring up Phineas Wayne, and he says, whoa, that's way over my head. Don't You can't bring up that. That's not relevant to this discussion. Bing, bang. What is it? Okay, get rid of him, Marcus. He, he, he fucked up. You know, the, <laughs> he doesn't even know. See, they have naive, literate views of what the wake is. They think it's elitist art. It isn't. It's rock and roll. But, but 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 what if but what if the ideas that that they're writing are still like relevant ideas even if they even if they as you say come from the Finnegan's Wake like what no no they're still they're still imparting some of those ideas even if they're saying they don't like is there no value in that okay or? we're we're uh, this is the cry of the literate kid but we just I know, no I know. value <laughs> in the thinking Bob <laughs> I know I know. I know. <laughs> But this is perfect. Now we can go into rock and rolls is Phoenix Wake and Print, or vice versa. <laughs> but uh, uh, there is no content ultimately in Phoenix Wake. There's no possibility of an idea to have any staying power in, in the uh, tactile environment. And for literate people, to not be able to maintain a point of view, that is hell. And so when you're frustrated by that electronic Niagara Falls of information, you can't hold on any point of view, you need a release. So you retrieve the ear, and you retrieve a, na- a loud ear. And rock and roll was loud in the 50s. It got louder in the 60s, and louder in the 70s, and multi-leveled in the 80s with MTV. This stimulus, this balancing of the no, the void that electric environment creates in the literate mind, the left hemisphere, rock and roll serves an anesthetic, medicinal purpose there. And so you hear, you see Meltzer racing along, just celebrating the, the, the medicine he's taking, all the bands of the mid-60s. And uh, I love every, he's really good at um, citing um, the good stuff. And I want to say, whoever wrote the article, uh, it might have been O'Brien, right. he, he runs through the autobiography of his ears. Not of him, yeah. of his ears, of his virtual ears. Yeah, he, I like that, he, Jeffrey O'Brien, yeah. Yeah, he ends with, hello, stranger, Barbara Lewis. Bingo! That's the greatest, one of the greatest songs of all history. I mean, I that, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think it's Hello Stranger he names. He names uh, something by her, but just saying Barbara Lewis is perfect. And, and it's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. You can go on Google or on YouTube and look at some some Pat Boone guy, you know, Bobby Darren replays all the greatest clips of Hullabaloo or Dick Clark. And you can, there's one of, they just go like five seconds each group, right, as they go through the hits of the 60s. And there's a little shot of Barbara Lewis, and I love that. I never saw what she looked like. And, wow. and, and uh, there's, there she is. She's a chubby woman. But uh, now, I'm talking about the ecstasy. McLuhan in the 60s talked about we're in the era of millennial or millinery, either word, millennial ecstatics. This is, you see, Meltzer's, I, he tries to throw in the philosophical categories and immediately cancels them, knowing it's irrelevant. He's trying to be right hemisphere. He's celebrating the ecstasy that this stuff puts him into, but he doesn't recognize that it's going to drive him headlong crash into an identity crisis, hit the wall, when somehow he wakes up to that process. And that happened, I guess, 6 8, 6 9. He, The music changed his timber, its pitch, and he didn't like it. So he stopped. All right? Yeah. And you, you sort of, uh, to, to stay within the game, you've got to say, okay, I've got to change my ears. I gotta start getting used to this stuff if I want to stay in it. Maybe I will get used to it. Uh, the thing is, is that it is a it is a definite anesthetic medicine, rock and roll. You know, it's Viagra, it's uh, Prozac, it's all that stuff. And and then you can explain when we get into the digital era how the digital environment shrinks all the old analog media like rock music and all that. So people don't want music anymore. They just want a drug. They just want Prozac. <laughs> Why be mediated? Just put me on a drug. So. Um, okay, so so the millennial millennial ecstatics, that electric, you know, look at the Dobbs quadrant on my chart. You'll see that um, it's all ecstasy. Whereas the Rouge Crop quadrant is paranoia, McLuhan Pro quadrant is schizophrenia, the Thompson quadrant is hysteria, and the Croker quadrant is panic. Now, those that don't know anything about my stuff, uh, you know, you just ignore what I said. But for those that do, you'll see the Dobbs quadrant is ecstasy. We've been in, we've been stoned in electric ecstasy since about 1960, at least, you know, when television and, uh, became a mass environment. Everybody's been stoned. And now it's flipped into a digital fragmentation, and that's a different kind of ecstasy. It's actually, you could say the, the, ecstasy, the ecstasy of the 60s is a consumerist ecstasy. Now it's a producer ecstasy. People get out and make their own media, their own YouTubes. 
And even though there's no one watching, they get the ecstasy of producing it. Hey, look, look what I made. Right, right. <laughs> you know? So um, let's see. So we're talking about, is there any ideas? No. Uh, there's no ideas in rock. And here's, here's Meltzer's dilemma. He's educated on the history of uh, Western philosophy and art culture, and he has a McLuhanite as a mentor, Alan Krup- Kapral, right? Right. Yeah. I don't know. He, he might have heard about McLuhan. He probably heard about McLuhan through Alan, you know, his mentor at college. Uh, McLuhan wrote about uh, Kapral around that time. It wasn't published until a few years later in the book Cliché Archetype. But anyway, so here he is trying to be, when he says philosophy, He's talking left hemisphere categories, and he is not embedded in a literate environment like his parents and grandparents were. He's grown up with radio and TV. He's not really on the surface a literate person. He is right. living in the electric effect. But push when push comes to shove, it's like what he said in the mirror. I, I wish Meltzer would hear all this stuff someday, because I can remember the details. And Meltzer looks in the mirror at the time, what, he's 40? And he goes, yeah, I guess I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is getting older, and McClellan predicted. He said in the 60s that the baby boomers, when they get into the 30s and 40s, they'll start reading a lot of books because they will now have acquired a bit of literate identity, a bit of stronger individualist identity. They'll have a job, a role. They're not some kid running around trying to figure out how to be ecstatic all the time. They actually had responsibilities, so they develop a left hemisphere validity, and at that point, they started appreciating books. So, I mean, it's incredible if Meltzer heard this. Hey, McCombe predicted your big insight at the age of 40 that you'd go, wow, I'm a left hemisphere person, I'm a writer. <laughs> but the thing is, the stylistics ain't left hemisphere. It's derivative of Finnegan's Wake, and it's ranting. And so we come back to Meltzer, ranting, celebrating the ecstasy, trying to, he's not even trying to be uh, a writer in the 60s, in the early, in mid-60s. He is just loves to write, and he says he's a visualist. Look at that. He's a Wyndham Lewis eye man. And he actually replays Lewis because Meltzer, as Chris Gow said, was a social jerk, an asshole, and all that, right? Right, right. I never met Meltzer. I don't know if he is or not, but I can see a bit of it. He's, he's probably a contrarian. Whatever's happening in a party, he'll, he'll start an intellectual fight probably, or not even show up or leave. Uh, he's kind of rude. Well, that's the way Wyndham Lewis was. That's what an eye person is. Meltzer's an eye person. But you can't be an eye person. You know, when he says he's a visualist, he might as well say he's a painter because you can't just be a black and white literate page eye person. You've got to be a visualist like a painter, like more senses than just the black and white of the eye. Color is tactile. So he's a colorist, and he likes looking at spect- spectacle stuff like wrestling and then, put, and then do a painting of it. And that's exactly what Fitting's Wake is. It's just it's also a painting. He's not just being a, an alphabetic prose stylist or writer. He is he's spewing with okay. a visual bias. And his personality matches that. He's an individualist. He's he's against he he actually doesn't know what he's for, but he's against the conformity that he perceives, right? Okay. He's actually against the tribalism that ear represents, but he doesn't like commodified virtual tribalism, people consuming a product rather than going out and screwing somebody, uh, or having sexual hedonism orgies, which is, uh, sounds like what he's for, chemical body uh, ecstasy, ecstatic releases, uh, he doesn't like the usurping of that by the virtual reality of, of televised music, and how he objects to how that's taking us over. We cannot stop it. There's no chemical body meaning and purpose in it. It's just for your virtual ears and eyes and virtual tactility. You're a consumer in the discarded state. And that's the robotness, the cyborg aspects of Matt Marcus and Chris Goh and the regular professional critic that he objects to. Right. And so what's he do? He starts to say, I'm a writer, and he starts reading books. <laughs> he takes on the difficult one. And then he's stuck. He's He's, he's gradually getting more and more marginalized, like any writer today. Even Norman Mailer felt marginalized eventually, because it's irrelevant being a writer today. Okay. It was, yeah. it, it's irrelevant to have ideas. It's not irrelevant to get on a, a radio show and be intellectual and talk ideas, but they don't have any staying power. No, one, no one's going to live by them like they did 100 years ago. Right. But but through through all this. No, I don't want to get you depressed like ten years ago. So we're, we're oh, trying. No. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 through all this like sort of tension, I guess that you're kind of describing in Meltzer, you know, 
I mean, I, I, I just still don't understand how you can say through all of that, I mean, no ideas are coming out. Well, it's... I mean, if you look at the aesthetics of rock, I mean, <clears throat> I can po- I mean, you know, we will do this. We'll point to... Yeah, we'll go into sentences. I've marked we'll them. We'll go into some sentences and stuff, but I mean... There are ideas. Those. There are ideas, but they're just glimmers. They're just references, uh, tags to say, oh, remember that? Remember when there was a Nietzsche and that meant something? Remember when there was uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre? He references, and then he's saying that all this is comes to him. His intellectual epiphanies come to him when he's in the ecstasy and throws of a, a Petula Clark song or a Stone song or something. Right, right. A Barbara Lewis song, like. He's trying to reconcile, how do you visualize <laughs> what he's feeling on the tactile proprioceptive level, which is what rock does. It's not just an ear experience, it's a multi-sensory experience. And Fitting's Wake takes all the senses and implodes them, and then tries to separate them, tease them out. That's why Fitting's Wake is rock and roll in print. Rock and roll is that synesthetic experience. But, but, but why isn't something like Aesthetics of Rock or something like Real Marcus or Robert Criscow writes, why? Why? Like, is it? I mean, is it part of the conversation? It is a trend. It's one. It's one fifth of the process. If you accept that there's five senses, McLuhan said there's only four. But and he thought he thought touch was tactility was not a particular sense. It was the interplay of senses. So you can say there's four senses if you take tactility as interplay, or you can say there's five senses, which is more mainstream, and see uh, don't not know what tactility is and just call uh, the fifth sense touch. But when you're interplaying all the senses, that's when you get synesthesia. And definitely writing is one-fifth of the process. Architecture is another fifth. Dancing is another fifth. Music is a fifth. All four or five senses are interplaying. All extensions of those senses and in in institutional aspects are equally relevant, but it's all canceled out by the ecstasy of immediate communication that the uh, electric environment gives us. Okay. McLuhan used to say, people aren't interested in, in what... Uh, and now I'm quoting McLuhan because that's easier for people to understand. And it's hard to understand me because I'm post McLuhan. But just to keep this uh, approachable, uh, people, McLuhan should say people didn't turn on the radio to to hear what's on. They turned on the radio to share the discarnate space because they knew everybody was in the space. It's like jumping into a pool. And but see, but see, someone Grill, Grill Marcus has has written comments to that effect. I mean, he's written about. I mean, he didn't use the same terminology as McLuhan, maybe, but he would write about, you know, the the, the impact of tuning in to the radio, knowing that other people were tuned in, and that that was the thrill of thrill of the ride in some ways. Okay, there it is, total cyborg response. McLuhan said McLuhan didn't believe the medium was a message as a concept. He said people will more and more live as if the medium was the message. People were more and more what? Sorry. Would live as if the medium oh. was the message. They okay. would live it. It wasn't an idea or something that he was for or against. He was just describing the weather. So here's Grail Marcus celebrating the medium of radio. And that's not a critical function. That's just celebrating uh, Richard Nixon and the environment of capitalism, if you want to get ideological. That's just getting duped by the environment or saying, oh, maybe this beats capitalism. But it didn't beat capitalism, did it? And neither did capitalism survive, as we've seen the past year. But the the interesting thing is that he is not providing a critical relationship to the ecstasy of sharing the same space as everybody else. But see, Bob, here's something I I never hear you go into with with Ben, or I don't think in any, all all the time, excuse me, I've been listening to your stuff. Yeah. I've heard you talk about this. But um, the word emotion. (laughs) (laughs) Don't I sound emotional? No, maybe I don't. Okay, no, but <laughs> I sound passionate. I mean, is 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 an emotional like why? Is That's what I mean by ecstasy. Why isn't an emotional? But but why? It is nothing but emotion in the electric twentieth century. It is nothing but emotion, tribal emotion, but, or personal emotion. But but if 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 every not everyone well so maybe it is everyone. But if everyone is 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 feeling a, like a similar emotional response, we're all swimming in in this stuff. Why isn't it why isn't it useful or important for for someone to at least point out to some degree? Well, this you know this is this is my sort of uh, slant on you know the stuff that we're swimming in or whatever. Like and, and you know some will even sort of go a little further and and try and explain like in a bigger picture. I mean it, it, you know in music criticism or rock criticism you probably ninety nine point 
five percent of it is garbage. I, yeah, you'll get no argument from me on that. It's no, but it's the emotional response. It's trying to addict, articulate your emotion. But 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 what I'm saying is, what's why is what's the uselessness of 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 someone doing that well and and if if, if now, wait a minute like, doing what someone like. Doing well, what just, well? Just, Being emotional. Right. <laughs> just you no know, describing the emotional response. Oh well, we get that we get that twenty four seven. An advertising an advertisement describes an emotional response to a product. Yeah, but I, I'm not going to I'm not I'm not going to y- utilize my brain. Okay, I think what you you're saying about you mean. Let's try to figure out what you mean by emotion. Okay. Uh, what, I guess what I mean by emotion in this case is, you know, I, I, well, I mean, in the simplest way, it's like I, I feel, I, if I feel what a song does to me or something, it has, if I'm DJing at a wedding or something and, you know, the particular beat kind of moves me in a certain way, it's like, yeah, it's like it just, it kind of, you know, it does it, does it to me and it's, it's like I'm swimming in it or whatever. So for me to then sort of like, Flip into my uh, right hemisphere, I guess, and, and or my, sorry, my left hemisphere, and try and put that on the page and and make it mean something or or, or give it give it some sort of descriptive quality. I, that's what I'm kind of thinking of rock criticism. Yeah, well, that that is what happens. And, and but but why is that a useless why is that a useless function? Because if if it can, if it resonates with people, like, isn't it good if, if if me as the reader, like, can if someone else can describe that experience for me and I and I understand that emotion or that feeling, is there there's, there's nothing wrong with with that resonance? Is there? If I'm no, it, there's about? nothing wrong with any experience. Um, but look look at Ben. Ben's not getting any emotion out of mainstream media for decades, right? Right, right. He's mostly dead. He does find things he likes, but they're pretty obscure. He thinks yeah. they're obscure. So, yeah. so he's he is not able to respond to the present and, and get emotional charge out of it, whereas I can. But I don't I don't put uh, great stock in an emotion I have because I'm going to have another emotion and I enjoy them all. So, so where do emo- where does emotion fit into the the five bodies model? Mm, I would say all five bodies register emotion. I think emotion is the is consciousness. Okay. And I think you you mean uh, a certain associative emotion, maybe a bit of idea or assertion of your identity. That kind of emotion is what's your purposeful emotion, almost in retrospect. It's like a, a particular kind of emotion that you're like you're saying you you like something well everybody likes something and you right. and what is what is significant about that why why do we make an issue out of that well well what i'm saying though is yeah it, it, everyone likes stuff so i want to understand or try to understand ah let me just why hold why on. do i like stuff like yeah, a lot of people no, don't I think, care let, they don't you know they don't they're not going to read rock criticism cuz they don't care they just like the music and the right music. here is here is the thing um I think I got it. Why are we more numb and not emoting, we think? We're not getting any emotion. And all of a sudden, something happens, like you have in the Meltzer interview. Is something going to happen? I don't know. It might happen, but I ain't looking for it in rock. This, this sense of something happening that's significant to you, that's rare for people because they're so stoned on the, on the ecstasy, what Fittings way called the mood mud of television, that they forgot fragmented emotion, a special emotion. So uh, another way of saying that is I'm picking up what you're saying that you get an emotion and then you realize shit I've been I've been rather numb the last three weeks <laughs> you know and let's look into what that numbness is the numbness is actually a constant stimulation that you're used to you actually need to bring in some strange uh, I don't know uh, old scenario right like right. remembering when you were a kid and, and thought you were somebody before you became a working drone. Uh, that might be triggered by something. You could call it your identity, isn't it? Isn't what you're saying is that there, that um, we don't actually today register emotions too much, and everybody looks rather subdued, especially in New York City. Uh, when I was there all those years, um, they all look like zombies. Then something wakes them out of their zombiehood. 
And that's the kind of happening that Meltzer celebrated and Bang right. celebrated. And the contradictions is that they are looking for it in a virtual environment, an electronic environment, that is numbing people in general and making you need an emotional release or like a rocket ship to another space that isn't in the glo global discarnate impl implosion. Right, okay. Okay, isn't that what we're saying? Yeah. You're saying... I think so. I think so. No, I think, I, think, I think that makes sense. It's like if, I mean, if I just relate it to pop songs or something like that, you know, you listen to a lot of stuff for, you know, whatever period of time. It's like, oh, yeah, like I might, I might walk around with my iPod on, on shuffle, and be constantly flipping through songs like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. shit, that's, that's the one. And, yeah, and also, yeah. I literally will, if I'm going to work some days, I will replay a song four or five times. It's like, yeah, no, this, this, and I mean, I'm thinking about it too, though. I'm not just like, I mean, I guess I am drugged by it, but I'm also thinking like, I sometimes think I want to like actually try and figure out why, like what is it about this song that's doing it to me right now? And I might even like I might even head to my desk at work and actually jot down some thoughts about it, like you know the experience of listening to this song or or what is it in that like why did this song at this particular time grab me in such a way? I mean yeah. that that to me is rock criticism. That that's almost my definition of it. Like what happened to me at this time listening to this song? And why was it so compelling or intriguing or screwed up or fucked up or whatever? Right. And then you are then translating into another kind of emotion, the emotion, the mood of sitting down and trying to write it. See, right. that, that's an emotion, too. How is that an emotion? Well, if you, if you look at, if you define emotion as oh, I, yeah. interplay of mind, body, spirit, or consciousness... And the sensory environment, I, I, people go mind, body, spirit, but I add perception, the immediate technical environment around you, the, the environment of tools. You, you are thinking, okay, you, you're trying to translate the emotion the, the Walkman gave you into another medium. You're going, you want to look at it right, right. And, and categorize it within verbal terms in your head, meaningful right. statements, meaningful prose. And that is an emotion, too. If media environments are different states of consciousness, that is an emotion, too. So actually, when you know what I'm saying, I'm way more emotional than everybody because I notice how much emotion I'm engaging no matter what media environment I'm in. Okay. If I break down the boundaries of what emotion is. Right, okay. So, um, so the, the, it's good you said that. You shift, you're listening, you're listening, and you're shifting. I heard that. And you're, oh, this. Now, what's interesting is you can even see it in the Meltzer articles. And, and, and O'Brien's article, Autobiography of My Years, they are trying to figure out why they liked someone at once, uh, something at one time, and then five years later didn't like that and liked something else. This right, shifting right. and what you, what you like changes. Like, you know, many times uh, something I didn't like 20 years ago, I like now. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, but uh, it's a different, I'm a different situation, different motion, different reality. For some reason, that, that, it's almost like it's a massive MK Ultra mind control program, and and the central scrutinizer is sending out all these frequencies, and he knows that people will surf the different frequencies and react to one and don't like it, and then end up over in the other part of the frequency uh, spiral and like that, and then two years later not like it and go somewhere else. So we're bouncing within this incredible squirrel in a ch a squirrel in an emotional ch a cage, spinning cage, uh, jumping off at different points to say, yeah, this is what I like. And then if you notice how much you're change, you are changed and how your taste changed, then what you write when you when you what you wrote five years ago about something, you yeah. would look at it and say, well, that was a unique experience. I wouldn't even respond to that song that way now, exactly. but I might yeah. write something about another song I didn't like five years ago this way right now. No, precisely. I look at stuff I write all the time and think, oh God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what I'm saying is, what you. That is not something to be upset about. You have to realize you're living 200 years every 12 months. I was on KPFK last week with Jerry Fialka, and, and in the course of near the end of the thing, somebody was disagreeing with what I said, and I said, look, I changed five times during this interview. Don't yeah. quote what I said uh, an hour ago. That's not the same person as who you're talking to now. See, <laughs> so I'm changing that fast, and I'm making, trying to make people aware that they're changing that fast. Okay. So you okay. use this idea 200 years, and so... That's what. That's where if you're actually trying to write something down and finally get it right on paper, you're missing the uh, 
the ecstasy that you're going to be in for the next 20 years and the change you're going to be put through. I mean, that's what Dylan, that's really what the intellectual, the Dylan poetry came in, and it was starting to point out the changes you're, you know, I'm younger than that now. Just pointing out the changes you're going through. Elvis never did that, but uh, Dylan did, and that started, struck people. Oh, yeah, we're, we're going through changes, and we can change faster. They did not read McLuhan and realize they were going, they were changing a lot faster than they even thought of. You know what I mean? But they could at least begin to notice that oh, I'm changing, and now it's a whatever kind of... Uh, Agreed upon dogma principle that, uh, that people go through changes. Yeah, they do this and that. They contradict themselves. You know, all these things. It's all accepted now. Wasn't accepted in the '60s that you would change that much. Right, right. Now all this change. If you turn off the electric environment, you wouldn't change that much. So we're all we're all cyber extensions of the change flood caused by incredible media turnover. Okay. So, um, okay. So here is bangs and craft work. Let's go back to that quote. One guy says the machine is better than the hand, and right. and then Bangs tries to one up him saying, "Well, the hand, the nervous hand, is, is not as good yeah. as, as it, anything a hand can do nervously, a machine can do effortlessly." Right. So he is he slightly agreeing with Kraftwerk there, or or saying, "Well, effortlessly is not cool because there's no effort there." I think he's being a little cheeky, but I'm not sure. I think. I, I think. I mean, I think through that whole article, it's hard to say. I think he's kind of like he's competing. With, he, he yeah, is, he's, he's competing. competing. He's competing with them. Yeah, I think he's trying to take everything they say a step further, maybe. Because that's what he's going to do. Irrele- it's irrelevant whether he agrees or not. It's just he's he's kind of looking at it in a in a different way or something, or trying to look at it. Yes, and we're, and but, he kn- he knows we're enjoying his cognitive interplay with them. We're watching the battle, the competition, right. you know, right. and he's playing up to that. And that's why people like Dylan and anybody who becomes a big star who thought he wanted to put ideas out, he very quickly realizes that this is a post-information society. It's, my idea is not the issue. It's, it's When Time Magazine wants to interview me, they want to take a swipe at music. They want to take a swipe at the radio environment and prop up the medium of magazine writing. You see, right. there's a con- there's McLuhan said there's a civil war among all the media. I mean, people think McLuhan, you know, like TV is so ridiculous. No, no, no. We're talking about a global theater and the media environments and the representatives and journalists and producers are all competing and being cagey with each other. And, you know, in the in the TV shows, they they put it into spy drama. But then, no, no, it's not spy drama. It's not fighting over a, a war or a terrorist group. It is the daily espionage of every medium going out there with their microphone and putting it in Dylan's face and say, hey, come on on this, because I need footage for my TV program. Right, okay. And after a while, as people got savvy to this in the 70s and 80s, then there's the competition. Everybody realized, well, no medium is more important than any other medium. We're all dancing about architecture, and that's great. So I'm going to wake up my aspect whenever I engage with something, and I'm going to compete with them, because my stuff is as important as theirs because it all gets canceled out in the wash. In the Niagara Falls wash, so, so that's so you see, Dylan and Nicholson, they don't they don't get interviewed much because they know there's a game being played, right, right, you know, and then others who don't who are naive, uh, Newfeld hears about this all the time. They, these uh, new groups that come through and they get a little fame and they get interviewed and then they get all pissed off at what happened to them. They didn't get right the correct coverage and then they react to that. Um, yeah. They, that's a naivety that they don't teach in schools. They don't te- prepare the kids for what's coming, that they're in a monstrous, you know, cannibalistic environment of information chewing up by every medium of every other medium. And uh, and the only way you can get released from that is to turn up the volume. There's <laughs> a very interesting statement by McLuhan that in the 19th and 18th century, music was a had a corporate function, meaning a tribal or cultural function, it released people from the fragmentation that a literate society, just having books and newspapers, they couldn't get together. So they needed amazing music to unite them in the, in the ear. Well, he said that in the 20s, well, at least by uh, the 60s, music was no longer uh, a tribal, corporate, cultural uh, event. It became a private concern. Now, that's a real interesting phrase. Private concern means that a literate individual consumer in the 20th century is going to prop up the old ear as an important part of its, his ID, his identity. 
Right. And that is what rock writing and why Rolling Stone and rock criticism kind of did. It became a cultural force as much as the old journalists and the old authors and novelists and movie makers thought it was a bunch of idiot kids. No. Cream and Rolling Stone match with the literate kid the baby boomers need to hear an expression of of music as a private concern. Right. And you know, by your time, kids argue. What's the main argument in, in high school and junior high is over what band you like and what crew. Yep. You know what I mean? Exactly. may yeah. not be that now, but it certainly was for 25, 30 years in the baby boomers generation X. Yeah. You you expressed your personal hipness or identity or nerdiness by what band you had, and by the yeah. '80s it got it got that people were because everybody lived 200 years every 12 months they could see this pattern. So by high school, kids would purposely say they hated they liked something just to have a different identity to go against the tribe, right? Yeah. They didn't even yeah. like them. They pretended they liked the Smiths or what are those silly girls that couldn't sing? Were they the Smith sisters or something? Uh, I don't know, the Spice Girls. No, no, no. The the, the uh, three girls, their father recorded them, and they can't sing and they can't play the guitar. The Smiths. Oh, not not the Shags. Maybe it's the Shags. Yes, the Shags. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three girls, right? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Exactly. Their their father kind of like was kind of brutal and men made them like make this music and they, <laughs> they didn't have a clue about what they were doing. And 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 and, and what critic actually liked them? Lester Bangs. <laughs> yes, you see, you see, and because. You know, you got to come up with a new uh, angle to get attention every week when you're doing a column for the Village Voice or something. And, right. and Metzer got tired of that. You know, he didn't. He, uh, you know, he could be person. It could be his astrology sign. It could be personal background from his parents. Whatever his personality or temperament was, he got tired of that situation. So he went on and celebrated wrestling. Right, right. And and all kinds of other things, but. Um, uh, Bangs was a fanatic. He stayed at the grind for ten, thirteen years, sixty-nine to eighty-two, right? Yeah, although although he he wavered a lot, and and I think more and more, like the last couple of years in particular, you know, he kind of gave a lot of indications and hints that he was completely sick of it and didn't want anything. His, his last there's this like yearly critics poll, the Village Voice Paz and Drop poll. Yeah. And in his, his last um, ballot in I think eighty-one was basically just a complete sort of piss take on the whole process like like making up albums that were never released and you know saying he was only interested in old blues records and stuff like that and no interest in remaining current and blah 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 so of course you know after he died there's you know there's always been a sort of a little side argument among rock critic fans like you know would he have continued writing about music was he going to go on to something else whatever well that's why he committed suicide he couldn't get out of that bind um you know that's why he died. He because actually rock writing was more relevant to people because they would read it. They they, they have to take their a week off of life. I see it on the beach here. So many people reading as they're bathing in, on the beach down here. That's the only time they read. But they have they take a big vacation come here and they read a book. You know what I mean? Right, right. But, but they're reading reviews every day back in the mainland in the, in, in, in the newspapers every day or on the night on the online. They're they're reading uh, quick reviews. Critics save people time. So, Bar- so here was Bangs, actually a very important public service, what he was doing for the, the hyper-entertainment lifestyle of New York. Um, he's providing this thing, but it's killing him. And he wants to have an identity. Uh, he wants to become a literate left hemisphere novelist or something. And right. yet he's more important than novelists in terms of social function. Yeah. And he gets wiped out. Now, here's where you know Meltzer went through the same thing. So Bangs arrived at Meltzer's state. Because Meltzer got in there early. He was right there when it was supposedly really great, 65 yeah. to 68, right? Yeah. Um, but but the, uh, here, um, Meltzer is shocked at Grail Marcus and Chris Gow and Goldstein still doing it 30, 40 years later. They obviously have to be numb, <laughs> to zombies, right? <laughs> They're inhuman. I mean, you know, if you're human, you would, you would end up like bangs. You'd check out after 13 years. How can they do it for this long? There's something being faked here. Well, there's something inhuman. There's no emotion there. Ah, but what is emotion? Chris goes, say, I have great emotions every day. I, I love what I hear. It's fantastic. And, uh, well, how real is that emotion? Well, I wouldn't say it isn't real. Well, I mean, if it was, if it was, but if, I mean... Sure, some of it may, it may be a sense of being a replay or something, but I mean, 
if if Chris Chris Cow could still pull off a good column, you know what I mean? Ah, in other words, we need to have someone write good columns to make uh, <laughs> to give meaning to what the three thirty years of experience I've had this week. You know, I've I've processed a lot of movies and records and books and headlines and information, all this media. I got to get someone to give me the weather report, and so Chris Coyle is there to, to sum it up. With, well, that, in in some ways, I would say yeah. Yeah, that's their role. They they are, as I say about John Stewart. John Stewart is worse than George Bush in terms of keeping this madness going. If you think this is madness, and a lot of people do think it's madness, right? So why is he worse? I don't get that. Big pardon? I, I don't get why. Why, why he's worse than George Bush. If, if you because he gives us temporary meaning about the absurdity and mess that Bush is creating. If we didn't have a John Stewart, I mean, he's more important than the church. He's more important than the university. He gives these kids go and watch that news, and it has to be fake news because they know there's no real news. So fake news becomes a stability function for them. It gives them a sense of, oh, well, we're here. Someone's told me where it's at. They've made fun of that guy. Oh, it's good to abuse that person. All right. And, and so Stuart and Saturday Night Live satirize all this stuff. It is a necessary enema every week for people, every day now. And, and so how do you, and this is what I present to Ben all the time, how are you going to have a revolution, whatever one you want to have for your chemical body? How are you going to put a stop to this madness? Or maybe it's all great, so stop being depressed, Ben. Enjoy it all. Yeah, and Bush ain't a big problem. He's doing his part. He's providing bad scenes that, that John Stewart can make comedy out of. It's an amazing ecology of interpenetration. And that's where a, a point of view is ridiculous in that situation, or an ideology. Okay. okay. Yeah, so John Stewart, what is he? As a matter of fact, someone was telling me John Stewart's getting a little... Yeah, your map was telling me this. Um, that the other night, last week, John... John uh, Stewart was shocked at how Fox is still getting away with its fantasy news. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and map has heard me, and he knows. He knows that we're in a post-information society, and John Stewart's beginning to realize that. It doesn't matter what we're doing, what we say, what we satirize. They're not listening. They don't have to listen. And we're not going to wake people up to it. Those that want to engage in the Fox hallucination will continue. Right, right. So there's no, commu- there's no connecting. And uh, there's no, well, there's no stable identity you can form. There's no idea that you can say was a good idea. It's medicinal. Robert Criscow is a doctor. Everybody's a doctor today. I call this the new medical unconscious. But uh, that's, that's another, that's an idea <laughs> that requires extra listening in later hours, <laughs> if you ever got the time. <laughs> okay. Let, let, let me read another quote uh, from, from the Kraftwerk piece, because it's on the emotion topic, and may, maybe, you know, we've, we've said enough about that. But um, So Bangs says, I, I told them that I considered their music rather anti-emotional, and Florian quietly and patiently explained that emotion is a strange word. There is a cold emotion and other emotion, both equally valid. That sounds like Richard Mel- Meltzer. It's not body emotion, it's mental emotion. We like to ignore the audience while we play and take all our concentration into the music. We're very much interested in origin of music, the source of music, the pure sound is something we'd very much like to achieve. It's really just the emotion part that I was interested in there. So he sounded like me. I was trying. Yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was, and and um, so they take a stance. This is in uh, the mid seventies, right? Yeah, seventy five yeah. or seventy six. Yeah, thirty, thirty four years ago, third of a century. But it doesn't seem. See, that's another aspect. With instant replay, none of this stuff seems that far ago. We can yeah. retrieve this stuff instantly, so it's still part of the present. And I've been known to have said, we never left 1945. We're still resonating in the same pinhead of vibrational software consumption. Just been overlayered, layered over and over, more rich stuff that's always still there. Right, right. Um, so, um, okay, so he's, Kraftwerk is saying uh, there's more than just whatever emotion you like, Lester. Yeah. You know, the, and, and the cold it, emotion and other emotion, both and the mental, have, and we could body and mental, yeah. right? And we can broaden into that. There's emotions caused by our media extensions, or what we call the machines. They have evoked new emotions, and the traditional Platonic emotions or uh, Christian emotions are too puny compared to the new emotions we're trying to express, because we the machines are new parts added to our bodies. So it's actually, in my terms, Kraftwerk is saying, hey, hey, Lester, we don't just have a chemical body. We've got, we got a TV body. 
We got an analog media body, and right. we and we want to engage the emotions and respond to that. And you, and the chemical body audience is not that important to us. Okay. That's what he's saying. Well, we don't care. We yeah. don't play for the audience. So yeah. Ben is it's a Ben. So Lester is there as a. And actually, in the same article, they mention how they they turn their back on the audience. They don't. Yeah, they don't care. So anyway, go on. Yeah. No. And and and. And yet that appealed. People didn't feel insulted. I mean, they liked Miles Davis doing it back in the 60s when he turned on the audience. Well, um, some critics some critics reacted against it. Yeah. Oh, there's always yeah. going to be a range of responses. But they right. still, now Kraftwerk is like a huge icon. They were a great yeah. band, you know? No, it's true. And now, and now that period of Miles Davis is, is the exalted period. And yeah. And at the time, the, the jazz the jazz establishment, you know, completely tried to shut it out or whatever. So. Right. So always, new art, as McLuhan says, is always ugly. New forms of expression. So Kraftwerk was ugly at the time for most people. Right. But those that were, for whatever reason, to be hip or were hip, knew there was something being communicated by those guys turning away on us and ignoring us. That, that There's something to be said. They probably couldn't articulate it, or they did. And then they wrote it in their novel or the newspaper article or slam their right. boss yeah. with it, you know, but they, they, at the next, you know, argument at the bar, well, you're into Frank Zappa, what about Kraftwerk, you know what I mean, Kraftwerk's where it's at, sir, and uh, <laughs> play a little game there with your boss, but the, uh, the, and it's all leisure activity on the big level, right, society has a lot of time in his hand, Kemmer has got a lot of hand with the wealth of the 70s and 80s, a lot of leisure time to sit around and argue, but what, consumption becomes a private concern, <laughs> all right, okay. and, and so, um, uh, so people are intrigued and fascinated by the, the, the environmental meaning of craft work. You see, people are always, they are closet media colleges. People go and, you've heard many people probably say, I've heard it many decades, oh, I don't like the new Hollywood movies, but I go there to see what the audience is into. Right, right. Everybody's always trying to figure out where the society is, and it's increasingly a virtual image. And that's why they watched John Stewart to find out the, the, the virtual image, because TV is such an old medium, it's archetypal now, it gives a sense of community. So you find out what John Stewart says the audience is uh, doing and what they satirize, and then you have a sense of where you are. <laughs> right, right. Okay. You see, the processing of this pattern recognition means that memory is not even important. McLuhan used to say that by the 70s, people knew that databases had more knowledge about themselves than they could remember. So they put on forgetfulness or amnesia as an art form, as a response, because the human's always ornery, always going to be different than whatever seems to be happening, just assert itself. And so uh, we put on forgetfulness. <laughs> and then that's become a norm now, the whatever, whatever. Can you imagine Charles Dickens being interviewed in 1850, or Karl Marx, and they ask him about something that's going on in, in India, and the workers are being pummeled and killed, and, he goes, whatever, no way. He would, yeah, he'd yeah. speak for 15 minutes with this impeccable prose. Right, right. Okay. So so here's here's one other thing. There's, a, there's another quote from the Kraftwerk thing where they talk about uh, synthesizers being referred to as cold machinery. Um, and, and, you know, I noticed that today even people still have a tendency to refer to certain musics as being cold or something, mm, yeah. meaning it's it's more like you know, samplers, and synthesizers are considered cold, whereas a guitar is not considered cold. And it, it doesn't, I can't seem to make sense of this in, in trying to put it into, it doesn't seem to work for me with um, McLuhan's sort of um, hot and cold terminology, you know, which he obviously used more for television and stuff like that. What, what are people getting at, do you think, when they describe a synthesizer sound as being cold? Well, I remember uh, when I first heard the stuff in the 70s, I mean, uh, what was it that Don Preston had on the Fillmore East album? Uh, he had a, a Moog. Moog was the first thing, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it sounded uh, weird, and I remember not liking it completely. It was alien sound. It, it did sound hard. Even yeah. though I'd listened to Sun Ra and Albert Eiler and Coltrane, that this it was it's actually when you think of it, it was the beginning of the digitizing of music. You know how people don't they many people insist the vinyl records are better. There's there's stuff lost in the digital. There right. was something about the digital. And I don't know if the Moog was a digital instrument, but it was starting to move that way. That was lost, and uh, the only way people could articulate was it's cold. There was something missing. But you know, you look at a generation say growing up in the 90s what was cold to their parents is not cold to them 
What is interesting is what they think is cold. You know, the, the 10-year-olds today or the 15-year-olds, what do they think is cold? It's probably totally bizarre what they think is cold. Right, right. You know, and, and so you look at the mix, the, the clothing, the technologies that they wore. So here we were in the 60s. We had analog TV. We heard about Sputnik and the satellites. We had FM radio. We didn't know anything about digital technology. We didn't know that the, you know, um, the guy who invented the uh, mouse was over there in Stanford with Stuart Brand demonstrating the mouse and early digital stuff for computers 20 years later. Right. Uh, unless you were, well, me and my buddy knew because our job was to keep up, keep up in that. But I'm just talking about even though I knew about it, I still had conditioned sensibilities. And so I hear uh, the St. Clavier. I heard people uh, in when I was living in Nova Scotia at the art college, they had guys come in with weird... I don't know, oscillators, you know, yeah. and it was ridiculous. It wasn't entertaining, interesting at all. But if I stood back and said, okay, they're beginning to turn the electric analog media into an art form, just like Lewis and the, the constructivists turned the hardware machine into an art form in the, in the uh, 20s, here you have the oscillator using digital technology turning and mutating the TV experience. The TV experience actually was an oscillator experience, but you didn't see it that way because you thought TV just had people and movies on it. So here you are using McLuhan's principle. You're moving into a new water. It's a digital. And so the old electric analog becomes figure, becomes art form. And that is usually too fast. Back then it was a slower time, too fast for people, so it just sound cold. But now craft work sounds warm compared to whatever you, don't, you can't take today. Right, right, okay. You, you, you know the group, the um, the Human League. I remember them. I don't know much. They, about okay, well they sort of they they're, they're sort of out of the craftwork mold, but they were much more sort of poppy version. They were like a British um, one of the early sort of synth pop bands. Yeah. So they kind of took you know. They, it was That's all the early '80s, right? Early '80s. They used all synthesizers, but you know they were kind of writing songs more like almost in a Motown sort it of It was thing. almost like the, the irritation of the early 70s by the art students with their oscillators had, by 10 years, people were now going to hear that. If a little sugar was thrown in, they could take it. That's what yeah. you're describing. Yeah, exactly. But, but you know, this has been commented on before, but it's just a, one of those sort of, I don't know, things to meditate on or something. But Human League Dare, which was, the, you know, one of the big albums of 1981, that was the album that was on Lester Bangs' turntable when he when he was discovered dead. <laughs> he just couldn't take it anymore. It was too yeah. cold. <laughs> if music is going this way, I, I want to get out of here. You know, <laughs> it killed him. Probably people think, oh, he liked them and he was into them. One right review. No, it killed him. It just, yeah. Well, well, and I mean, because he he did spend so much of the last couple years, especially really like. It's interesting because in that seventy five, seventy six piece with Kraftwerk, he's he's kinda of like well, I'm just gonna say he's kind of actually warming to the idea of like synthesizers taking over and stuff and although he's being kinda of cheeky about it and stuff, he's he's kinda of like glimmering something interesting in it that he's feels, you know, a pull towards, but by the time of like seventy nine or eighty he's like kind of become so dead set against almost any music that has this like sort of pristine clean technological that he, that he, that he created his own band and started screaming and yelling yeah and he reverted to listening to not, literally to nothing but like old blues records and stuff like that he just like Meltzer the grain of the voice and all that just, yeah. just like Meltzer says in your interview with him in 2000 uh, I, I'm into the 20s blues <laughs> into the blues <laughs> yeah. way back this is just, this is and he's just, killed, killed by the human league's dare. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we now know why Banks died. It's always been a mystery. It was the human league. But back then, everybody thought he was like liking it or something. No one, no one, now we have the perspective of thousands of years to look back at the changes people go through and how they eventually conk out and can't take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's interesting. That, yeah, if he was already objecting to that in 7980, then Human League was like the popularization of that. It just yeah. was too much. Oh, my God. Yeah. I lost. My movement <laughs> failed to stop this. <laughs> okay, so... so the, too much. Yeah, so you have the... Looking at the technological environmental mix, you can really figure out why things, why things become mainstream. Like, you can see that the speed-up of... Uh, 
Okay, first of all, the speed up of newspapers by 1820s or so, I don't know the exact decade, uh, made people like lose their visual bias, left hemisphere decorum, and they actually went for the waltz. <laughs> Did you know that the waltz was considered a radical anarchistic move? Yeah, I've, I've read that before. Yeah. yeah, okay, so you look at the period, whenever it was. I mean, I could go quickly on Wiki, but I won't bother. You get the period. But you would look at the railroads are coming in, uh, I don't know, coaches, uh, uh, newspapers, and maybe the telegraph. Life is really speeding up for people, right? Right, right. And music is like the speech. You know, music uh, is the uh, language of the culture, altered, speeded up, slowed down. So in ancient cultures, it was Chinese music is so different because Chinese speech is so different from British speech, right? So the music's right. different, but you're molded by your speech. So then when you use McLuhan and Joyce's insight that new technologies are new languages, they color the music. They change the music. So the music changed with the waltz, and then you had, what was that thing called at the turn of the century? The Ragtime or the catwalk or the, I forget what the they. Or something. What'd you say? Not the fox trot. No, no, the it's it's ragtime. Whatever that. Ragtime, called. yeah, like Scott Joplin and stuff is like like nineteen like oh five. Yeah, right? now you see footage of that. Yes. You see the the flappers or the flippers or the clappers, whatever right, they right. call. Them. You know, dancing, <laughs> and they were considered wild maniacs. You know, and they're just jumping up and down. But the speed up, okay, the music has to get faster. Okay, so they're not using visual waltz decorum anymore and how you step in your, your dance step. It's just move fast, right? Okay, so then you get in the radio, um, radio era in the 20s and 30s, and obviously the, the bordello music, the whorehouse music, the speedy music of the, of the blacks and the blues fits the rhythms, and that becomes Louis Armstrong and jazz. Right, right. And that is, you know, imagine a, your Queen Victoria, if she was alive at that time, or, or her husband, Prince Albert, whatever he was. They'd think that was like the, everybody's on Terrence McKenna's uh, ayahuasca or something, right? <laughs> They're just yeah. shocked by this. But it's, it, these are new generations growing up with it. they got to adapt to the rhythm. They're going to they're gonna dance faster. They're going to dance faster to the architecture. And the architecture is the linguistic technological structure that's molding the senses of the people. And music is a translation of that language, all right? It's a perspective, a way of looking at it. Okay, so then you have jazz, and then, um, and that's the radio era. And then all of a sudden, TV comes in in the 50s, the jazz guys are saying, hey, nobody wants to hear us anymore. And they don't have the detachment to say, well, well it's because the environment's been changed. The government released a new medium, the sensibilities are changed, and uh, our music ain't going ain't gonna to do it. You know, it's not fast enough, or it doesn't have the right timber. It's too shiny. You need you get TV and the black and white image and the tactile, guttural, mood mud effect of television. Obviously, an Elvis kind of music is going to is going to be more appropriate to what people are really feeling, though they're not that conscious of it. The music, the music actually seems amazing because it's translated their experience. Yeah. And they and they don't see. They just see. Oh, I like the way he moves his hips. He's handsome. Uh, I'll get laid with this music. You know, it's all this. What McLuhan called user as content. You put your own chemical body bias into it. But if you stand back and look at the sociology, you can uh, understand. Okay, so then that's TV, black and white. Then you bring in color TV and satellites and uh, video in the uh, beginning of video cameras, but that's the late 60s. But anyways, in the mid-60s, it is incredible, a global theater. Everybody's doing their own thing. Music's got to get louder. The ear has to be heard. It's got to get louder. Right, right. Psychedelic rock. So then, then you get um, the uh, prog rock of the 70s, right? And yeah. then you get disco. And disco is the, uh, the globe, the, the, the uh, globe made into that ball, the disco ball, is like the planet, totally inside the global theater, but it's been shrunk now by digital, digital uh, answer machines and all that in the, by the late 70s. And so Studio 54 and disco takes over, and that mania is... Uh, is um, uh, appropriate for the sensory needs, and and what is it? It's every millions of people in a big room just thumping away, right? Yeah. And and no interest in melody or whatever you want to call the great Motown sound of the '60s or blues. I remember in the late '70s, you know this. I was listening to As It Happens, and a couple of famous musicians, Muddy Waters or something, were interviewed by Barbara Frum about uh, how they couldn't get gigs in the clubs anymore. Disco taking over. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that probably helped Louis Farrakhan. Oh, this is racist. White man's killed our music. Okay, that's a racist thing. But it wasn't. It was a technological effect. So then you, so then you have um, um, punk in reaction to that because by that time, kids, can, kids are not going to conform as much. You're actually so fragmented by the satellite environment that you actually will be, start to be different on purpose. So punk fits in the people that don't want to be involved with disco, right? Right. Like you didn't ha did you have a rea in the 50s, as Meltzer was, you went back to jazz if you didn't like Bobby Darren in the early right. 60s. You, did, right. you had a call and response and you could go back to another kind of music. But I, uh, yeah, maybe also, I mean, industrial culture, they had pub music in the 19th century and they had vaudeville and then they had the courtly. Well, so probably was you know, class levels of musical response or, or ideology in the music you chose. But it gets more frenetic after World War II because music becomes a pri public concern. You could say in the 19th century, the pub music was a class and the waltz was another class, and they weren't, it wasn't a private concern. It's just that the classes didn't mix. But after World War II, the classes are mixing, and then people's ID has, identity has to come into it. And it's almost like an astrological sign. So, uh, you know, uh, Miles and them provided an anti-environment to rock and roll with jazz, and then Coltrane came in to provide an anti-environment to all that by just playing noise. And then, and then um, what do we have... Uh, and then you have Meltzer, Bobby Darren uh, stuff, and Meltzer goes back to jazz. But then Rock hits his G spot, uh, the Beatles for some reason, and he's released yeah. again. He jumps into that stuff. Yeah. And, and his rock criticism is a diary of music being a private concern to his for his identity, because he doesn't want to deal with the McCullum and Finnings Wake tactile environment. That would be real perception to actually deal with that. But you're not expect a 25 year old to do that they, they gotta live their life as McLuhan says they're just vegetables these kids let them grow slow evolution slow progress by the time they're 50 they'll understand what I'm talking about but can't get them when they're 20 <laughs> let them have their millennial ecstatics and enjoy the doors and Jim Morrison and, and blow the brains out with their drugs and, and uh, herpes but the but the uh, you look at when you now you get in the satellite environment, the digital environment, the personal computer comes in, in the early eighties. TV becomes an art form, and so TV and MTV takes over. So video, it didn't kill music; it became the new music. Right, right. It became tactile environment as entertainment. The ear was gone. Okay, if you're a sentimentalist for the ear, you're going to be upset about that, like Meltzer and them. But young kids, they they live in that water. It's real. So what is, how are you going to respond to that? Well, you start, heck with uh, even making any music, just start yakking and ranting and, and put as much imagery in what you're saying as fast as possible and rhyme it. Yeah. Hip-hop shows up as the end environment yeah. to that. Yeah. And that's not even music for people of older sensibilities. What the hell is that? Yeah. It, you yeah. know, it's, and you can see that the speed... The, if you've got these kids growing up in the 70s, 80s, and they're getting all this TV and information blatting at them way more than the 50s and 40s and 60s people, what are they going to do? They're going to just cram images as much as possible and do it as fast as possible. Why bother learning to play guitar? Just say it. And you just verbalize it and cram all this imagery in. That's keeping up. Rap is faster than psychedelic rock because right. you get, you've got to cram all the images in. Has anybody ever explained this before? I have, but this is the best explanation for why rap becomes important. Because you can get more information in there faster. Well, and there's the, uh, I mean, to tie it into the uh, Chuck D quote from Public Enemy saying rap is uh, black, black people CNN. Yes, black people CNN. Now, now isn't that interesting? There's the... the uh, he has that perspective because he lives it and he's creating the art form, but he doesn't have the, the larger, more mature detachment that he, he's saying it's our CNN, but is it revolutionary to be a CNN? Yeah, well... Yeah. That, they can't go that far. You can't get that test. No, no, we're going we're gonna to save our people. We're going we're gonna to get rid of white man or whatever we're going to do. We're going to go back to Africa. All that tribalism is the only chemical body response. But the CIA and the real managers of society, like I was on, the Tetra managers, they're looking at this all across the globe and just saying, oh, let them have their little mini revolutions. Let them think that they're being black. A black person isn't black anymore, isn't black by the time you have television because they've got a TV body laid on them, and they're not just black. They're, they're whatever you want to call the TV body. What color is that? 
It's the you know what it is? It's the color of the band you worship. That's what color it is. The music band you're into. <laughs> hey, that's a good statement. And look at it in the in this decade, the kids speed it up even more with their Facebook. Or remember MySpace? You go there and they list a thousand movies, a lot a thousand records, all their whole profile of old analog media. That was what they were. Yeah. You know what I mean? A total super collage of all this consumption of different older media. That was yeah. that's who they were. <laughs> Looks like a page of Finnegan's Wake. Yeah, yeah. So you can see that uh what did, what did um Plato said uh what did he say? If I change the music, I change the republic. Ah. Something like that. It's a famous quote. See, he Plato was a mime. He was an oral tribal guy. But he got the, the alphabetic bug and went, I. He turned into Wyndham Lewis and didn't like oral music, which he was an expert in, and developed the idea of the republic where a visually biased philosopher king would, would drive the oral poets and the musicians out of the republic. Okay. And, and so there is a quote from Plato, something like the Fugs quoted in one of their uh, late oh, 60s. I don't know it, actually. Yeah, it's uh, that when the music changes, then the society changes. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, so that is in a slower time. When the technology changes, the society changes, and so does music as a subset of the technological change. Okay. And that's what I'm showing in my chart. I just list all the... I just say, you know, 50s, uh, jazz, uh, 60s, Elvis and the Beatles, later 60s, rock, then disco, then rant and, and hip-hop. I just name them. You can say, well, you're just listing what happened. Yeah, but if you look at the other part of the chart, I'm showing the technological ground that made that music popular. Right, right. Okay. I mean, McLuhan said in the 60s, um, if, you, if tactility is extended by the global theater and television... And we're numb by tactility. The older senses, the eye, ear, nose, and uh, foot, will counter that by becoming hyper. So we had hyperkineticism. Why world of sports in the 60s, watching surfer, uh, surfers and, um, and uh, car races. Okay, that's hyperkinetic space going hyper. You had loud music. You had hyper uh, visuality in the arts or whatever in, in movies. And... Um, you had uh, hippies being stinky, <laughs> hyper smell. Anyways, all the old senses went into hyper mode to react to the, the void, the black hole that tactility is. Because tactility is the interplay of senses, not any particular sense. So McClure would sit there and he'd be aware. Uh, he quoted, uh, he did a Life magazine article. He did an article, you know, his book, Cultures of Business. He quoted Richard Goldstein's uh, article oh, on the. He? on the new music that was in Life magazine in the summer of 60 or something, he, uh, okay. the summer of 68. He would, he would just look at what's happening in, the, in magazine culture, what's happening in music, what's happening in sports. He'd just look at the whole thing, and he knew that they'd all have the same characteristics as the hidden medium that no one noticing, and the hidden medium was the satellite at that time. You mean the whole thing about doing your own thing? The reason, I mean, the... You know, uh, housewives started saying that by the by the 80s. It became a norm, but it was a uh, was outrageous in the 60s. But really, to do your own thing was to get off the planet and the media complex and to sail around the planet like a satellite. So doing your own thing was, I'm going to be not a machine. I'm going to be a satellite. I, I'm going to ignore all the media tribalism. <laughs> and of course, that got swallowed up by digital reality, and then that gets canceled. But it's a passing fancy. So. When I reread these articles, to me, there's scientific evidence of the mood mud that was caused by technological phases at that time. Okay, okay. So we could begin to go in them unless there's some other aspects. Well, Bob, the only thing is I've got to kind of watch, um, like, what's, what's the possibility of us continuing this conversation another time, too? No, we'll continue until we finish. It might take five sessions. I have no yeah, problem. Yeah, okay. Okay, no, that's good, because um, I definitely, I mean, I don't even feel I'm <clears throat> a quarter of the way through. Oh, no, we're going like, definitely. This could go an on. eighth of the way through the stuff, but, I, you know, I actually do have to get out of bed probably in about five, six hours. Oh, okay, so what's this, the, uh, um, the Bob and Scott? Bob and Scott. Sure. Bob sure. and Ben, okay. Bob and Scott. We'll, we'll counter this to Ben. We'll send these to Ben and see. Yeah, <laughs> we'll no, it's like the... If it's a mini series or whatever, that <laughs> that's good. 
No, but this is awesome. And sir, and like I've got, you know, like I say, I've got notes on a lot of this stuff. And I think in terms of the stuff I've sent you, we've only actually gotten through some of the bangs. So we haven't even really touched on. We the haven't started. Quotes and all. Yeah, we haven't started. <laughs> we haven't started. This was all just uh, me saying same. my punchline. It's like Finney's Wake, the same message on every page. But I have to keep cycling <laughs> around to figure out what's meaningful to the audience or to you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, okay. McLuhan had a line, let me repeat what I was about to say. <laughs> That's what our next thing will be. We're going to repeat what we were about to say. Okay. Uh, that sounds good. Okay, Scott. Cool. Well, this has been very good. I liked it. And so you've got to go right now, so I'll keep uh, – I'm going to hang up and I'm going to call Scott Norris back and we'll talk about it. It's always good to sounds get Scott's, good. Uh, Scott Norris's view of this. So very good. I don't know if it will be next Monday or what day, but it, Scott is good on Sundays and Mondays. That's good for you? Yep, those are both good for me. So so maybe we'll do a Sunday. Yeah, let's be in touch between now and then. Yeah, just by email keeping up, and we'll continue. Yeah, we've just started. Sounds good, Bob. Although they've probably all fallen asleep. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we're into it. We're creating exactly. our own space in a post-information society. Exactly. <laughs> okay, talk to you later, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Bye. Bye.